What is that? Is that called like the fire part? Uh, no, I think it just pages uh, out for the office. Oh, really? Uh, Alright, so the previous lesson I asked you to do this worksheets uh, one from chapter seven. We'll start with questions from that. Does anybody have any questions? This should have been relatively straightforward, but if you guys want to ask about it, that's perfectly fine. Absolutely. Can we do number three or number four? Uh, sure. So, that's the only one I have in my hand, so probably not. Alright, so the A is 3, the B is 2 thirds, the H is negative 1, and the K is negative 6. So since the A is positive and the B is between 0 and 1, that tells me that this is the K. The horizontal asymptote is always Y equals K, so that's going to be Y equals negative mm -hmm. 6. I need to make my table. So I make my table by doing h minus 2, h minus 1, h minus 0, h plus 1, and then h plus 2. To find the corresponding y values, I'm going to plug those in to my calculator. So I do 3 times 2 divided by, uh, let's see, we have to go the opposite way. 2 divided by 3 to the negative 3 plus 1, and then minus 6. So 0.75 is my first number, my first y coordinate, I should say. one is negative 0.5, or 1.5, excuse me. And then if we change that to negative 1, that's negative 3. And then we change that to 0. And that's negative 4. And that's negative 4.67. So there's my xy table, so now I'll draw my graph. They're at negative six. And then we'll plot our points. So negative three and 0 0.75, negative two and 1.5, um, negative one and negative three, negative four, zero. Oops, what I did. And then 1 and negative 4.67. So it looks something like that. And then the last part asks for the domain and range. 
Well, for all exponential functions, the domain is all real numbers. And the range depends on a and k. Since the a is positive, the range is going to go from k to positive infinity. And that's all she wrote for that one. Again, it should be relatively straightforward, these graphing ones. It's not too tricky. There's nothing complicated going on, right? I'm just kind of following some rules. Uh, today, then, in the lecture, what we'll talk about are using exponential models. So we're going to be, like, kind of answering story problems. Is kind of the gist of it. So there's three exponential models that we're going to talk about today. There's exponential growth model. That's y equals a times 1 plus r to the t. And there's decay, exponential decay. y equals 1 minus r to the t. In each of those situations, the y is some future value, the a is some initial value, the r is the rate of change written as a decimal, so if it's a percentage, you have to convert that into a decimal by dividing by 100, and then t is time. The one thing you need to be a little bit careful about is making sure the time unit on the rate matches the time interval, so like if the rate of change is 8% per year, the value you put in for time needs to be in years. Everybody's okay with that. The second or the third type of model that we'll look at is this compound interest model. The equation there is A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT, where A is some future value. P is some initial value. In banking terms, we often call that the principal. R is the average annual interest rate, written as a decimal. N is the number of compounds per year. And then T is time in years. So for these compound interest situations, we're explicitly writing T or time in years. So these three models are what we'll be using to kind of answer our story problems. Allie? So is the R in the third model, is that different than the R in the third model? Like, not really. Okay, it's the same as rate of change. So the stuff for the, the letters for one and two mean the same things. Is that what you're asking? Uh, I mean, not technically, because one is an interest rate and the other is a rate of change, although they're kind of the same thing. They'll probably read as similar things in the problem, but I guess like an interest rate is a type of rate of change, but... The converse would not be true. Average annual interest rate as a decimal. So like the... Uh, oh, excuse me. The growth and decay models are kind of things that would be used generally in general situations. The, per, or the compound interest formula is one that would use explicitly in like a banking kind of situation where you're dealing with an investment. Allie? I'm sorry, what did you say that you added in one row? Compounds per year. Oh, okay. Sorry.
So let's look at some examples. So our first example says in 1996, there were 2,534 known computer viruses. That's not true, I just made that number up. Over the next 10 years, the number of computer viruses increased by an average of 86% per year. This is also not true, I made that, I made those numbers up. Uh, we're asked to write a model to describe the situation. Use that model to predict the number of viruses in 2006. And then lastly, at, we're asked, when will there be 100,000 viruses? That's assuming we're like in 1996, right? Maybe if I should, with better grammar then, that when, we're, when would have there been 100,000 viruses? That would have been a better way to phrase that since we're currently in 2021. Okay, uh, so let's start with part A. We have three models to choose from in deciding which one we want to use for this problem. One of them should be obvious that we don't want to use right away. That would be the compound interest model because this has nothing to do with banking or finance or investments or anything like that, right? So it, we're choosing between growth or decay. Now there's one word in this story problem that would tell you which one that you want to use. Growth. Growth, why? Yeah. So because it says increase, we want to use the growth model. When we write a model, we're going to have two variables left in our model, an independent and dependent variable. So in the story problem that's described, what is changing? What quantities are changing? Computer viruses. The number of viruses over time, right? So Y and T would be the variables in my model. So those are going to remain letters. We need to find something to fill in for A and R, though. Okay, with that. A is the initial amount. In this case, what amount is changing? Yeah, the computer viruses. So we're looking for the initial amount of computer viruses, which is the 2,534. And R is the rate of change, which in this case is 86%. 86%. And converting that to a decimal, we divide by 100, giving us 0.86. And now I'm going to clean that up a little bit by adding 1 and 0.86 to write that as 1.86. model. Yes, sir. So is the one always in the equation? Yep. So that's just like a constant term that will yep. stay? Okay. It's always in there okay. for the growth and decays. So part B asks, use the model to predict the number of viruses in 2006. So what quantity am I looking for, Y or T? T. I'm looking for Y because I want to know the number of viruses, right? That's going to be a Y value. So to find Y, we need to plug in a value for T. What value for T should I plug into this model? 10. Why 10? 2006 minus 1996 is equal to 10. Everybody's okay with that? So I'm just going to go to my calculator and type that in. Since to find Y, I have everything I need to do that. So 1,255,845. Are 
okay with that? Okay. The next problem asks, when will, they, when will there have been 100,000 viruses? What are we looking for in this case? What is this question asking for? When is asking for time. So we're solving for t, right? So to solve for t in our model, we're going to have to plug in a value for y. What value is going to go in for y? Not 1,255,000. If we solve that, we're just going to get 10 back again. So part C asks, when will there have been 100,000 viruses? We put 100,000 in. We put 100,000 in for Y. We want to find the time when there was 100,000 viruses. Everybody okay with that? Now, Currently, we lack the algebraic tools to find a variable when it's in the exponent. Right? We've never had to solve for a variable in that location before. And we don't have the tools algebraically to do that currently. That's something we're going to be building up throughout the course of this chapter, so that is one of our goals. But even though we can't do this algebraically, we can still handle this by using our calculator. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to do this graphically. So I'm going to go to the y equals menu. In one y spot, I'm going to put the left-hand side. So in this case, 100,000. And in the right-hand side, I'm going to put in, for the other y spot, I'm going to put in the right-hand side. 1,534 times 1.86 to the x. Everybody okay there? So just left side of the formula, right side of the formula. Now I need to pick a window. So x, the x variable is representing time. I know in 10 years there's going to be a million plus viruses, right? And I know I'm looking for 100,000 viruses, and we started at 2,500, so definitely somewhere between 0 and 10, it had to be 100,000, right? Everybody agree with that? So I'm going to take the x min to be 0 because, again, the x is representing time. can't have negative time, so 0 is a good to use there. And the max, I'm going to do 10 because I certainly know that, you know, to get to 100,000, or to get to a million, we had to pass through 100,000 somewhere in there. So that will surely cover what we're looking for. Now the Y's are representing the number of viruses. What was the minimum number of viruses we can have in this situation? Good. I'm going to just write that as 2,500, though, just because it's a round number. And then up to 10 years, what's the most number of viruses we could have? 100,000. No. Really? Million. Yeah, the 1,255,000. I'm going to write that as one million three hundred thousand just to make it an even number and going up by hundred thousand seems like a good idea there since that's like 13 tick marks or whatever and I'm just gonna hit graph so that first line is my hundred thousand this next line is my exponential growth curve the part that's going to answer my question is this point where the two curves intersect To find that intersection, we're going to press second and the trace command. Looking at this menu, which one sounds like the one that we want? Intersect, right? We're looking for the intersection. Let's use the intersect command. Now, the intersect command is going to ask me three questions. It's going to ask me to identify 
What two curves do I want to find the intersection of? And then where should I start looking for this? Now, here's the secret. If you have just two curves that you've graphed, like we will here, and they're only intersecting one time, like they will in these situations, you can just press enter three times and be done with it. You don't have to like move anything around. So that says x is 5.92. So I would say about 5.92 years after 1996, there would be 100,000 viruses. Megan. So to answer those questions, are you going to enter? Or right. No, you just press enter three times. If we set it up this way like we did, you, can, you don't have to worry about any of those questions. Just press enter three times and it'll loop. You can pick any place on any of the curves and it'll be fine because there's only two things that you're looking for the intersection of, and they only intersect one time, the calculator will figure it out. So you don't have, have to fuss with that. So that's not bad, right? The calculator did all the heavy lifting for us there. We just had to kind of set things up appropriately. Let's look at another example. You buy a new snowmobile for $8,500. On average, a snowmobile depreciates in value by 11% per year. We're going to write a model to describe the situation. We're going to use the model to predict the value of the snowmobile after five years. And then predict when the snowmobile would be worth $3,000. Well, let's start with the model. So we have three choices in models. Which one can we eliminate right away? Uh, um, Compound interest, right? Because yeah. we're not doing any banking. We're not investing any money, right? We're buying something. Even though money is involved, I guess. Uh, so we're picking between growth and decay. Again, there should be one word in this story problem that tells you which one you want to pick. Decay. It would be decay, and the word that you used to figure that out was? Good. The depreciates means it decreases in value. So we use the decay function. So Y is going to represent the value of the snowmobile in the future. And that's one of the things that's changing along with the time. As time goes by, the snowmobiles work less and less. So, y and t are going to be our independent dependent variables for our function. What value should we put in for a? The initial value for the initial amount? That would be the 8,500. And what should we go in for r? The rate of change. Written as a decimal, so 11% becomes 0.11. And if we wanted to, we can clean that up a little bit by subtracting 0.11 from 11. That gives me 0.89. B asks, what is the value of the snowmobile after five years? What are we looking for there, Y or T? Y. Okay. To find Y, we have to know we have to put in a value for T. What value of T are we going to plug in? Five. Five. So we just go to our calculator. So four, oh, that's cute. Four, seven, four, six, four, five. Huh. Everybody okay there? And then part 
C asks, when will the snowmobile be worth $3,000? What are we solving for there, Y or T? T. Okay, so what's going in for Y? 3000 right? And just like before, we're going to solve this with our calculator. Three thousand is going to go into one Y spot, and then the other side goes into the other spot. You should really ask you a question real quick. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I didn't really make that attention. To get to that slide, or that part in the calculator, do you just click alpha or Y equals? I don't even have to press alpha, I just press Y equals. Y equals? Okay. Now we need to set our window. So here, we don't really know what the T has to be, right? Because we're not told in the problem like the model is good for 10 years like we were in the previous one. So we're going to have to take a guess here. So we started at 8,500. After five years, it went down to almost half, right? Everybody didn't see that? And then to get to 3,000, I certainly think that within another five years after that, it would probably go down to 3,000. You guys agree? The halves again? Yeah. So I think 0 to 10 is probably fine. If we don't see an intersection, we can always bump that out. But I think that's a reasonable start. Is everybody okay with that? And there's a little bit of a guess there. We don't know. So there's lots of choices for that time. Okay. Now let's do the Y's. The Y's are representing the value of the snowmobile. What's the minimum value of the snowmobile? Uh, like money wise? Yeah. Um, 8,500. Or that's no. 8,500 would be the maximum yeah. value. That's the most money it's ever going to be worth, was the purchase price. Yeah, it's got to be 3,000. No. Really? Couldn't it be less than 3,000? Zero. Zero, right? The least the value the snowmobile can have is zero. Like after 50 years and it's just a rusty pile of seized up engine, we're zero dollars, right? It's, it's a piece of junk. It doesn't, doesn't do any good for anybody. Um, and I'm going to change my scale to maybe like 500 or something there. Like at 17 tick marks, that's not bad. Um, so let's hit graph and take a look at what's going on. There's my 3,000 line. Here's my decay curve. Well, we just barely made it in there, right? If we didn't see the intersection, we just go back and pick a bigger X max. But we can see it there, so we're good. So we press second and then trace, pick the intersect command, and then enter three times. And we get 893. So about 893 or 8.93 years after purchase is when it's worth three thousand dollars. Everybody okay with that idea? Again, not too bad, right? They all have kind of a similar feel. It's just about getting things set up correctly, and then everything else goes pretty easy from there. Uh, last example. You invest $10,000 in an account that pays 8.7% annual interest. Write a model when the interest is compounded weekly. Then how much will the account be worth in 10 years? And then when is the account worth $1 million? All right, so uh, which model should we be using for this one? Oh, the uh, investment. Yeah, definitely the compound interest formula, right? We're talking about investing money and earning interest and all that jazz. It should be pretty obvious from the context that that would be the model we want to use. Okay. 
Um, so again, we're going to have two of these letters left in our model when we're done filling things in. So in our situation that we have here, what two things are changing? The value of the account is changing over time, right? So A and T are going to be left in our model. So we need to fill in a value for P, which is the initial, initial investment for the principal. In this case, that would be $10,000. R, we need to fill in, which is the interest rate written as a decimal. In this case, that would be? Good. And then N is the number of compounds per year. So this problem says it's compounded weekly. So how many weeks? Are in a year. 28. That's incorrect. 52. 52. Oh, wait. No, 28. If it had said compounded monthly, what would end be? 12. If it was compounded daily, what would end be? 366. Sometimes it's 366. Oh, and every four years. Once every four years. Yeah. So 355.25. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hold up, time out. When did that next? When did the next four years and a half actually finish? I don't know. That was like thirty. I'm looking this up. Yeah. I'm not sure. It wasn't it wasn't last year. And it wasn't this year. They call it leap year. It was last year. Yeah, it was. Okay. No, I, I'm definitely sure it was. All right, 2024. That Holmes. Oh, yeah, we got Thursday, February 29th of 2024. <laughs> so, part B, how much will the account be worth in 10 years? What are we looking for, A or T? No. No. Wait. No. A. Yes. To find the value for A, we need to plug in a value for T. What value of T should we plug in? 10. Notice on this one, I didn't bother to simplify my expression because 0.087 divided by 52 is like a long, crummy decimal that I have to round. I don't want to round. So I just left it that way. So I have 10,000 times 1 plus 0 0.087 divided by 52. Raised to the 52 times 10. So that's 23,851.76. Everybody okay there? Part C asks, when will the account be worth $1 million? What are we solving for there, A or T? It says when, T, time. So to find T, we need to plug in a value for Y. What value of Y should we plug in? I would use $1 million. Right, because we're looking for the time when the account is worth one million. Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. And then we're going to solve this for t using our calculator, like before. So in one spot, I'm going to put a million, so that's one with six zeros after it. And then we have 10,000 times 1 plus 0 0.087 divided by 
two, to the 52 times x. And then I'll set my window. So here again, we're going to have to kind of guess at our x max, right? So it took 10 years to get to 23,000. How many years do you think it's going to take to get up over a million? Man, we're talking probably like 40, 50. 50? Yeah. Okay. Again, let me let me just give you a hint here. It's going to always be better to overestimate than underestimate because if you underestimate, you might have to go back and change the windows so you can see the intersection. So let's do 100. That seems good. That's definitely going to be more than enough. Um. Uh, Well, this is for doing nothing. Oh, oh never This mind. is literally like you sit there and just watch your bank account. Go up? Yeah. What would you even be able to use the last seat? Depends when you, you start it. If it's you, I hope you're still alive 50 years from now. Sure. Yeah. Uh, right. The Y minimum should be? What's the minimum value that the account can have? Really? 10,000. Why 10,000? That was the initial investment, right? Like you're never going to lose money putting it into a bank account. The maximum, well, I need to be over a million because I need to see the intersection. So I'm going to pick like 1.5 million. But this is just from like a, you know, I got to be able to see what happens standpoint. What if you rob a bank? Probably go to jail. How do people keep the bank doesn't store money in the bank? I can't do it, they don't store a lot of money. They don't have like millions of dollars there. Right, it's not like the movies. They do. They don't. They don't. They like the fake things. So people say they have a vault. Wait, where do they put it? Yeah, they have a vault. Where though? In the bank somewhere. In the bank. Where do they have the other million dollars? Like at the Federal Reserve depository. Uh, That's probably where I'm going. I'm going to rob the Federal Reserve. All right. Anyways, going to hit graph now. Here's my $1 million line. Here's my compound interest formula. There's my intersection. So let's find that intersection. So intersect command. Enter, enter, enter. So 52.98. So, if you guys, you guys are what, like 15, 16, 17 years old? You have $10,000 right now, and you invested at 8.7% interest. In 52 years, when you're at retirement age, at like 66, 67, millionaire. Doing nothing. Now, 8.7 is a pretty good rate of return, but that's not a bonkers rate if you have a you have a pretty good mutual fund investment, you have somebody, a good money manager working for you, you can probably get 8.7 per year. That's not like absurd. But the key to like being wealthy later in life is starting early because time is your friend. So like, try to save as much as you can, as early as you can, because that compound interest really pays off over time. So, well, you would be wise if you're currently having a job to go and take, you know, some percentage of the money you make in your job and start saving it. Like make, you know, like. Talk to talk to your parents. See if they have a financial planner. They probably do. Ask them if you can start setting up a savings, you know, like a savings account for retirement or whatever. I want to retire. 
your mid teens. Well, so, like right now? All right now. Not right now. Right now. Um, all right. So, that's the, that's the gist of this lesson. Again, relatively straightforward, right? There wasn't anything tremendously complicated. Um, your assignment for this is this worksheet, too. So, it's several problems, pretty similar to what we've just worked on. Um, any questions about that? Okay, we're going to stop here. You guys can spend the remainder of our time here in class.